<laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Kreezus, and welcome to the next installment of Nielsen IQ's Founder Series. This new video series will dive into the many facets of launching a CPG brand, from perfecting the formulation to securing a meeting with retailers, from getting on a retailer's shelf to scaling the business. Each episode will shine a light on the challenges and successes of startup CPG brands. Joining me today to share his story as a CPG founder is Maxwell Blessin, creator of Joy Milk Tea. Welcome, Maxwell. Hey, Andrew, it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome to have you on the show. We're very excited about this one. Um, so let's have some fun. Let, let, let's dive right in. Yeah. Um, give me a little bit of story. Who, who are you? What's your background? How do, what's the you know story about how you created Joy Milk Tea? Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm Maxwell Blessin. I'm the founder of Joy Milk Tea. This is uh, not my first business. I've been all over the place. I've been in tech. I've been in seafood import export. I've been in I mean, <laughs> home security. I've done, I've done a lot of stuff, but beverage is by far my favorite business I've been in. Uh, this has been an amazing journey so far. I basically got into this not by accident, but because I've always been in love with milk tea and there hasn't really been a mainstream American brand ever. And so I saw the opportunity and I decided to take it. Love it. No, that that I love the the story of you. You see an opportunity, something isn't there, and you need to bring it forward. Um, so tell me a little bit about that. How did, how did you know like what steps to take? You had the idea, you saw it, and and you wanted to create it. How, what steps did you take? So it was really natural. I mean, I'm very much so a person that just you know I'm one step at a time. So I see the okay. I see what, where I have to go, and then I kind of just build towards that. And so when I started this brand. I was basically in a Starbucks parking lot. I was addicted to iced Americano coffees. I was drinking like three a day. <laughs> and it was literally in that parking lot where I decided I was going to start a milk tea brand. And there I, I, I pulled out. I went to the store. I bought some, basically some tea and milk and sugar from the store and started mixing it up in my kitchen. Uh, wow. I have this little book with like a hundred different plus recipes. And then... Wow. I eventually landed on one that I felt comfortable sharing, and that was pretty much the start. That was our MVP, and we took it to a farmer's market, and it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, I mean, we started with the most minimal product you could possibly have. Like, it was a glass bottle, barely labeled. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh, It was quite interesting, but people loved it. That's awesome. And then, so what, um, once you started to create this this formula, you, ha you got the flavor down, yeah. uh, where did you take it? So the formula actually is evolving over time, but that's a separate cool. thing. Uh, we, uh, we started at the farmer's market, and I okay. originally thought the business was going to go DTC. Um, yeah. But our customers had a different plan for us. We were selling a ton of product at the farmer's market, built up a huge fan base. Mm -hmm. And towards the end, people were like, okay, where am I going to get this when you're gone? Yeah. Uh, and that kind of naturally progressed into them selling stores for us. I would get emails wow. and, and calls and, uh, that kind of kickstarted our wholesale business. Um, so we were making, you know, thousands of bottles a week out of a commercial kitchen selling wholesale. Wow. That's amazing. And so where, um, so as your, as your fans, right, your brand fans, it's so key to have that following. It sounds like that just launched you right into retail. Um, where did you go first? What were the first kind of retailers or, or wholesale that you got into? Yeah, so like natural boutique, I mean, we were delivering the product all ourselves. So like natural boutique stores, cafes, you know, yep. uh, local C stores, not like big accounts. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until uh, we were shelf stable that we started moving into bigger d accounts and distribution. Everything in the early days was basically make it in the kitchen, deliver it the next day. Yep, yep. And so how did you, that's an interesting point, um, just knowing a bit about your brand, how did you make that pivot? Um, what was the strategy behind it? Yeah, so beverage, well, all kind of CPG businesses have this kind of growing up stage where you have a product that where you find traction and product market fit. Uh, do people want this? Are they able to see it on a shelf, learn about it, buy it? Is there continued repeat purchase? Like you have to find out all these things first. If you can't figure out those things first, investing into scalable manufacturing is a little foolish. Mm -hmm. But when we kind of determined, hey, we have crazy velocities in store without any activation. Mm -hmm. We have huge customer loyalty. We have people coming back every single day to purchase our product ritualistically. Okay, there's something here. 
Uh, so very early on into that wholesale business, we knew shelf stability was the key because mm -hmm. at that point, our product was only maybe two weeks shelf life, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, but we never had a problem because it was always selling. Mm -hmm. But I knew that if we were, if there was going to be any chance to scale this, we needed to be shelf stable. So we were talking with co-packers within six to eight months of the of like the wholesale the perishable product when we started manufacturing the perishable product. So we were vetting a bunch of uh, co-packers, right? Mm -hmm. And they, uh, it's funny because none of them really take you seriously at first. <laughs> you have to really fight yeah. uh, for yeah. your line time initially. So uh, yeah, I mean, it was kind of natural. It was the natural progression of the business. And we had to, we had to move there or else there was no business. Yeah. Yep, exactly. You're 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 going to be limited, um, and it's really interesting, Maxwell. You hit on two of my favorite KPIs that kind of pinpointed your your I need to make this change. Two that you hit on loyalty um, and velocity. Just two super incredible measures uh, of of your health and the success of the brand, and you use that kind of a, as the pivot point. Um, so I love that. Now, what, what and, actually, some... and and I think one more important thing, Andrew, is uh, how much do you need to invest to activate a retail location? Yep. Because Sure, if you can, if you have great velocities, but it costs you, you know, hundreds of dollars in promotions or demos yeah. or whatever, yeah. uh, that might not be scalable. But for us, what was unique about our brand is that we have a shelf presence that's different than most other brands because of the category is so unique. And mm -hmm. so we had great organic velocities without activation, which was a huge. It was screaming at us that okay, let's scale right. to more stores. And then, so tell me a little about what, um, where are you now as far as, you know, retail presence? What have been the kind of the latest, if you look back the last six months, um, what are the biggest challenges and what's your latest kind of retail presence? Yeah, last six months have been crazy for us, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> a lot of it was due to Expo West, uh, which awesome. was an incredible event for us. Yeah. Um, we are in a, we are launching product this month into about 2000 locations, 2000 to 2500 all across the country. Uh, and then we're also planning a major launch with a national partner with Kroger at the end of the year. Um, so, I mean, we think realistically we could hit 10,000 stores if our manufacturing, and this is a Pick huge, this is a whole nother yep. can yep. of worms about manufacturing and the cash conversion cycle and making sure you have cash on hand. But yep. we have a really, uh, really exciting year ahead of us for sure. That's just phenomenal. I, lo I love to hear that momentum story. Um, and glad it's already accelerating. So that's huge. Um, now I want to pivot a little bit here, Maxwell. Tell me a little bit about how uh, now that you've gotten or you're on this cusp of, of major national distribution, um, how have you started to leverage or look into data and insights to tell your story? And how does that feed into your strategy? Yeah, so we use Nielsen IQ. Uh, it's been un it's been invaluable. Uh, we use data primarily to target accounts and then also to sell those accounts. So because our category is so unique, we are we're one of the first, if not the first shelf stable milk tea brand in the country. So it's not like we can go into uh, any data provider, any syndicated data provider and look up, OK, where are people selling a lot of milk mm -hmm. tea? We have to get a little bit more creative. Uh, so what we do is we use data to tell a story about how the coffee set is homogenous, mm -hmm. about how there are underperforming SKUs or underperforming brands taking up shelf space. Yep. We paint stories about how Certain retailers have other Asian inspired products that sell at high velocities or maybe are under distributed, uh, have a slower percent ACV than they should. Uh, and then we use this to kind of put together a story that, hey, milk tea would sell really well at this location. It could differentiate your coffee set. I know we're not coffee, but our customer is going for mm -hmm. the coffee set for a caffeinated product. So we, we use data to tell these stories and to get a retailer to buy in that, hey, this is a huge opportunity. Spot on, love it. Great, great strategy and clearly working for you. Um, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll ask a, a final question, Maxwell, um, one that we'll wrap up with here. What advice do you have uh, for any new CPG founders who are you know, maybe just starting off their journey, they're listening to this, uh, this video and this podcast, um, what advice would you have? How early are we talking? Like very early? <laughs> call, call, call it their first year or two, first year. Okay, let, let me give two pieces of advice. The first one is before you even start, you have to get someone to, well, I guess this is right around starting. You have to get someone to purchase your product. Don't, don't look for feedback from gifting. Like when you give people product, 
there is there's something I always tell people this. There's something sacred about the transaction. When you give someone something, they feel like they owe you maybe kind words or that they shouldn't. You know, they, they don't want to make you feel bad. Yep. So they won't give you thoughtful criticism. But when someone buys something from you, there's an expectation that the product is high, you know, it's quality. It's something that they're going to enjoy. It's something that they're going to want again. And so they're much more likely to give you the bad feedback as well as, you know, the really good feedback. Uh, and then also money talks. So if they come back and buy it again, you yeah. know that you're onto something. So never shortcut getting your first sale, no matter how silly it is. Love it. You know, try to sell it to someone on the street if you have to. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then as you move a little bit further, uh, always consider the value of time versus money and where yeah. you can afford to lose time and where you can afford to lose money. And always make decisions based on, uh, you know, what, you know, you got to have an end goal or you got to have at least interim goals. And so time and money are your two biggest levers here. And so you got to you got to always be thinking about, can I spend extra money or can I spend extra time to get there? Because um, a lot of people will get too sucked into uh, investing too much time into something or mm -hmm. investing too much money into something when in reality it was the other thing they needed to invest. Yep. Yep. I love that. So it's a balance of the two. Well, this is um, yeah. really good advice. And I love how you, you kind of paralleled both aspects of this time and money, the balance of the two um, brought in the element of it's not just getting feedback from anyone. It's getting someone to buy. That is so true. Right, like that's real feedback and it's also building in loyalty early on again loyalty key to getting that momentum underway absolutely um, very cool all right well thank you maxwell um such an awesome story uh super fan of this this uh brand and what you're building here something that i think our fans listening will totally get a lot of value from uh so this has been another episode of the nielsen iq founder series where we've dived deep into some of the most innovative brands and founders unpack how the brands launch and grow in this cpg space this video was brought to you by Nielsen IQ, where we're revolutionizing the CPG industry, democratizing data and analytics for emerging brands, and much, much more. To check out more, check out Bizer, B Y Z Z E R.com. Thank you.